Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Conversations That Count. I am Sri Lekha Pale, Vice Chair of Community Strategy and Community Engagement for Fairfax GOP and 11th Congressional District. As part of community engagement, I have been inviting community influencers, candidates, subject matter experts on conversations that count so they can shed light on important topics that matter to all of us and the communities that we live in. As some of you already know, there is a growing political crisis and conflict within Ethiopia since la late last year that has actually displaced millions of people and at least half a million people are at risk for famine. There are over 500,000 Ethiopians living in the United States most of them live in Washington DC area. The Ethiopian American diaspora is an important fabric of our own communities that we live in. And I want all Ethiopian Americans to know that we at Fairfax GOP and 11th Congressional District stand in solidarity with Ethiopian brothers and sisters and Ethiopian American diaspora. Today, I have with me Harmila Arigwavi, an independent Ethiopian American journalist and community organizer to discuss the growing political conflicts and crisis in Ethiopia. We will also talk to Hermila about focus, we'll focus the discussion on current administration policies and Ethiopian American engagement in US politics and policy making. Hermila is a co-founder of the No More Movement at No More Global. Hermila worked in mainstream US media for more than a decade and left in 2021 after being appalled by the twisted media coverage of the conflict in Ethiopia. Her resume includes CBS Los Angeles, Al Jazeera America, Crown 4 News in the Bay Area, among many, many other media outlets. She's a well-known community organizer and leader in Ethiopian American community. And I'm honored, absolutely honored, and I'm humbled that she accepted to come on Conversations That Count. Harmila, welcome to Conversations That Count. Sri Lanka, thank you so much. Looking forward to this conversation. Absolutely. I have been looking forward to it. And I know many more folks are looking forward to this. I received a lot of messages from Ethiopian Americans that wanted to listen to what you have to say. So, Hermila, before we get into actual the Ethiopian American, um, Ethiopian conflict, your journalistic experience is extensive and impressive. You began as a general assignment reporter at the station, moved around reporting main news, served as correspondent and digital producer, a segment producer, and you even became part of the award-winning coverage of the 2012 uh, presidential elections. After all that, why did you choose to walk away from mainstream media? That's a good question. Um, you know, the what was going on in Ethiopia was very important. Obviously, a war, uh, a lot of people dying in it. It was uh, an armed group that actually attacked national army defense forces, something that is considered the highest treason in most countries. And yet a lot of the narrative in mainstream media, the CNNs, the New York Times, the Reuters, uh, was very twisted, uh, was actually just flipped on its head and um, in the beginning, I tended to believe what was in it. Um, and so I too was sort of speaking in a way that seemed to uh, support this armed group called uh, the Tigray People's Liberation Front. But over time, because I have the you know experience in media and I'm able to sparse out uh, some of the details, the more information came out and the way that I saw the story getting painted, a lot of holes started to appear. Um, and eventually, um, I just realized that the narrative that was being told in the mainstream space was actually inaccurate. Um, I spent a few months just thinking about, you know, just observing and not really engaging in the social media space anymore. Um, and then eventually, when I asked a few questions to the supporters of this armed group that are out here in the diaspora and all over the world, you know, why are you guys supporting this war now that it's leaving that region that you said that you're fighting for? Um, then they got very aggressive, started to call my uh, job here at CBS LA, um, said that I was a genocide denier, all these different things. Um, and I was sort of put in a position where I either had to, you know, be quiet or um, uh, and, and keep my job or just continue to ask the questions that I wanted to ask. I mean, technically we haven't officially separated, but eventually I chose to just go on the independent route. Um, you know, having had a pretty good experience with the uh, the most previous job, um, 
and nothing being personal, you know, in terms of the people I worked with and, and things like that. But I had a value based disagreement with the way the story that about Ethiopia was being told. And so I embarked on an independent journey, um, you know, still something that I'm still figuring out. But um, I just wanted to be a voice of reason and truth, um, you know, and not watch the country and the, the, the people from the country around the world being divided based on ethnic lines, you know, lines that just really aren't important. Um, we're all quote unquote intermarried in so many ways. And I really just don't believe in this uh, division based on ethnicity or race or even political group to some extent, I think you should be able to have conversations across the aisle, but um, definitely don't believe in division based on something that you can't choose like your ethnicity or race or gender or whatever it may be. And so that's what the conversation really was. It was ethnically divisive. Uh, it wasn't rooted in the truth. And I just wanted to be a part of bridging that gap. And I think I have been able to do that. It's been challenging. The ones who want to ma maintain the mainstream uh, uh, narrative are bullies <laughs> and <laughs> they're very aggressive, but I've been able to manage this far. Um, and so, you know, there's, there is light at the end of the tunnel. We're hoping that there's some peace that's brought to the region. It may take a really long time, but I'm just, you know, glad to be a part of setting the narrative straight. Absolutely. Harmila, you kind of said a whole lot there. I really would like to dissect. That's a lot of valuable information for our viewers to know. Uh, I would definitely like to uh, dissect. I think one thing that you said about walking away from mainstream media, sometimes mainstream media can get to be a bully. If you don't agree with their philosophy, then you're not on their side. It could be the right side, but it, you may not be on the right side for them from their perspective. So for Harmila, for uh, folks that know about Ethiopia, that have Ethiopian American neighbors, um, give us a very brief rundown because we are going to get into each and every issue that we are encountering. Give us a brief rundown on what is currently happening in Ethiopia. I think, I think uh, for uh, Americans understand that there is a crisis, there is a famine, there is a political crisis, ethnic cleansing is going on. Uh, is there anything else very briefly that they need to know that's happening in Ethiopia that you want to highlight? Uh, Yes, I think it's worth noting that Ethiopia is a very large country. It's the population is about 110 to 120 million. It's in the Horn of Africa. It's the largest country in the what's called the Horn, that thing that sticks out on the right hand uh, side of Africa. Uh, in that Horn, there's also Eritrea, which is a much smaller country with a few million people, as well as Somalia, also a, a much smaller country than Ethiopia. Um, and so it's a very strategic location. Um, you know, it's 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 uh, sort of that bridge between the Middle East and, and, and everywhere else um, uh, along the Red Sea. So uh, it's, it's also a very diverse country in terms of ethnicity. There's 80 plus ethnicities. For 20 plus years, the uh, Tigray People's Liberation Front, which is an ethno-fascist group, ran the country with support pretty much across administrations in the United States. Although uh, I think I would argue among the Democrats, there's more personal relationships that have been built with the Tigray People's Liberation Front, which is where some of the frustration comes from among Ethiopian Americans, uh, is that those relationships are now being cashed in, um, and it's it's you know feeding into the narrative that's anti-Ethiopian government and anti-Ethiopian people because there are folks like Samantha Powers, head of U.S. Aid, um, uh, Susan Rice, who's not really in this administration but was very close to the TPLF and seems to have some influence. Uh, some of the folks that were during the Obama era actually seem to be the closest with the Tigray People's Liberation Front. And although they don't have, uh, most of them don't have official positions within the administration, uh, they appear to be having an influence on the narrative, which is where um, I think a lot of the frustration comes from. And then you see some policy within the Biden administration that's sort of conflicting to that. So it's a lot of mixed messages, but in general, Ethiopia is a very large country, very diverse. We have not been historically ethnically divided, but because of the previous regime, the Tigray People's Liberation Front, um, there are a lot of ethnic divisions that have been sown. And so we're all just trying to overcome that. Um, but you know, first and foremost, trying to uh, bring peace to the country after this group. Uh, attacked National Army Defense Forces and started this war two years ago. 
So Harmila, I think you briefly touched on it. Uh, again, every time you speak, there is such a great knowledge that I'm like, I need to dissect this and ask her the question. Um, uh, so why do you think uh, Horn of Africa is so very important to the United States? I think you kind of touched about it being uh, part of uh, uh, around Middle, uh, uh, Middle East and stuff, but I think if you can elaborate on that, that would be very interesting to note. Uh, why well, is it so important for us, for Americans? Yeah, my understanding is a lot of trade travels through there uh, because of the location. I think it's in the trillions or over a trillion uh, dollars worth of trade travels through there. Probably a lot of what we get from China travels through there. I mean, it's that, you know, that that uh, in between between the United States and Asia and the Middle East. So that's the biggest power that I understand that the, the horn has in terms of its uh, location. Um, and so that is why in so many ways it's important uh, to the United States and for Europe that it remains somewhat stable because otherwise, you know, there's going to be a, an, an interruption um, in the trade flow. Absolutely. And also, I think, as you said, it's a diverse country. It's a very, um, uh, I'd say it should be a close strategic alliance to the United States. It only benefits both the countries. So, Hermila, if I go onto your Twitter, I can't help but uh, try to understand about this no more movement, right? Uh, you were the co-founder, if you were not the founder. Uh, so what, what is this no more movement and where is it going right now? Um, so we're sort of in a, a place where I think we're trying to figure out the next step forward, but the its origins is in fighting disinformation. So for a year since the war started in November 2020, by the way, Election Day here in the United States, I don't know what the significance of that is, but November 4th, 2020, while we were all voting here uh, or getting ready to vote, this, this group started the war. Um, um, and so a year later, commemorating the year anniversary of the war. A lot of the P Ethiopian Americans, uh, you know, uh, Ethiopian Europeans all over the world just came together and said, we need to write this narrative. It's not right that the Ethiopian government that's fighting this armed ethno-fascist group is being demonized and being accused of all of these different things that aren't really rooted in any evidence. Um, you know, the people are suffering because of this war and yet it's their government that they democratically elected that's being demonized. And then it even went further with some Congress people like Congressman Brad Sherman here in my district in California. He literally said Ethiopians and Eritreans were starving the people in Tigray, which is kind of a terrorist stronghold at this point under TPLF. And so really the point was to come out, be fact-based, take, you know, information where we can get it and come out and just be very clear about what's going on. The Ethiopian government is fighting this ethno-fascist group. It's not about genociding all ethnic Tigrayans in this region. Um, uh, you know, the, who the TPLF is. They're not victims. They're not some ragtag groups. They were in government for 20 plus years. They have 80% of the armament in the country. That's why they started this war and thought they could undo this democratically elected government. So, so much of it is just rooting, rooted in fighting disinformation in a real way, not the way this current administration uh, is talking about disinformation. I think it's in fact, they've, they've flipped it on its head, uh, where the, the, the government now seems to have a monopoly on what's considered truth. And then anything beyond that is considered disinformation, which is a very scary place to be in the, um, in the United States of America, where freedom of speech is coveted. So uh, that was really the root of it. And that disinformation divides people. It divided Ethiopians all over the world. It, it div divided Ethiopians on the ground. Um, and then what does that lead to? It leads to conflict. And in the worst case scenario, it leads to war. So we wanted to cut it off at the disinformation place in hopes of bridging gaps, bridging people that had been divided. I mean, I'm talking about family members and friends just cannot agree on what the narrative is because you see something in mainstream media, but then the truth is uh, something different. And, you know, truth be told, the Ethiopian government, their strongest suit is not communication, uh, at least not to the international uh, community, they communicate to their their citizens, but I don't think they have the same sort of leverage to, to communicate um, uh, to the rest of uh, the world about what's going on. And so we wanted to fill some of that gap, um, uh, you know, for the sake of the people. Um, and that's really what we set out to do. And I think we're getting somewhere, you know, because after we came out, there were some stories that were not favorable to TPLF uh, that acknowledged some of what the Ethiopian government was up against. 
Um, and I think we see a lot of the same issues in this country where disinformation is really dividing people. It's creating conflict. Of course, it's not necessarily war here, uh, but it's, it's kind of the same step. We just happen to kind of stop at, at war, but there is conflict based on the same type of issue here. Harmila, I'm glad, I'm glad you started the movement to kind of work on this disinformation. I, I always say disinformation is threatening the democracy, right? People are so divided. I will come to the divided community. You spoke about that quite a bit, and you are a terrific leader in your community. So I want to know what you're doing to bring the community together. But before I go there, um, I think you briefly said, was this no more movement in different countries too? Are they still talking about it right now or is it just in United States? And my second part to that question would be how important is this no more movement to the United States or how threatening because it is disinformation. So mainstream media doesn't like it. Current administration doesn't like it. So how threatening or how important is this movement to the United States? So the first question, when No More was launched last November 2021, it was two parts. It was a social media campaign where we created these link trees with all this different information um, in it that people could share with the hashtag No More. And then there were rallies that were planned in about 30 different cities all across the world, um, including in Addis, where over a million people, millions of, I think, people in Addis actually came out. But uh, uh, around the world, too, it would add up to uh, millions because... Like I said, it's a huge country, 120 million people. Um, so it was two parts. It was a social media campaign. It was pushing back against the disinformation and then rallies all over the world that was very, very well attended to make the State Department, the European Union, all these different entities that make decisions, the UN, uh, show them in person that there are people that are watching what they're doing. They're unhappy with uh, their approach to it. Um, and so it's, it's, it was global. Um, it wasn't just in the United States, but most of us that started it were here um, in the United States. And then um, the second part of your question was about disinformation. I was just wondering how important or threatening is this no more movement to the United States? Right. So here's what I know. Um, you know, I just have anecdotal evidence. So someone within the State Department more than once has said they don't like the no more hashtag. They want us to change it to something like Ethiopia facts or something very sort of generic about Ethiopia. Um, and they've said it more than once. Um, you know, they think because they give aid, you know, we shouldn't really be pushing back on them in terms of what they're doing with the narrative. But like I said, the, the problem is it's confusing. So on one hand, Secretary Blinken has said, you know, the Ethiopian government is accused of ethnic cleansing. And then on the other hand, he'll go to Africa and say, we need to work with African countries as partners. And then you'll see people like, you know, people in the, within the State Department um, that are in one case, I, I believe she's a diaspora liaison, uh, who, who brings together these people that are anti-government, that are tribal in nature. There was a recent um, meeting with the uh, latest special envoy for the horn, Mike Hammer, who is the fourth special envoy for the horn within the last year and a half to two years alone. So they, they have this meeting that's supposed to represent all Ethiopians, but at least a third of those people are actually anti, uh, not just Ethiopian government, but really the people in so many ways because they're ethnically based. You know, they're, they're for their own ethnicity, but not the rest of the country in, in so many ways. So it's been very uh, divisive. You know, I, I don't know why the State Department, you know, chooses people like this to represent them to the diaspora, um, you know, if what they're really interested in bridging that relationship between the US and Ethiopia. So I do think it's threatening because it uh, shows that we're very united, um, that we're seeing the pattern, not just about Ethiopia, but some of the issues that are happening around the world where disinformation is being used. Ukraine is another example. I'm not an expert on that, but clearly there's some disinformation um, happening there. And, and it's not the first place, it won't be the last place. And so I think they want us to speak about it as if it's an Ethiopia issue, but the majority of us in the movement see it's a larger issue of global disinformation um, that's happened to many different countries under many different administrations. Um, and I think that the world needs to just move on a little bit for the sake of all of us, you know, not, not, not because of charity or anything like that, but because it's just getting to a point where the people aren't buying it. So if the people aren't buying it, you either need to change your approach 
or know that you're going to have a lot of resistance to it. And there's a lot of resistance to the current administration's approach right now. Now, Mila, I definitely would like to talk about those policies of current administration. But before we go there, um, you, you talked about community being very divided. I mean, we see that in America, everything is polarized, either you're this side or this side, but you really can't, uh, can, be a, uh, can be a moderate and survive anymore. So, but since you are such a um, huge community influencer in your own community, I've seen it with my own eyes of how much you can influence the crowd with how you speak and how you act. So what challenges are you facing in um, bringing the divided community together? And also, what do you think is your role in bringing the community together? And can we even bring Ethiopian and the Tigrayan community together at this point? It's, uh, I mean, it has been quite um, divisive. So can we, is that a, even a realistic goal? Uh, you know, okay, I'll put a pin in that last question because that's the biggest question is, you know, can we undo some of the damage? So the reason that, you know, people appreciate what I do is because I have crossed that ethnic line, right? My, both of my parents are from Tigray, so technically I'm ethnically Tigrayan, but I do not support this political group that's ethno-fascist based, right? And, and that was, that's, that's what uh, makes people appreciate me because there's not enough of us that are from Tigray. And, you know, like I said, I really bought into the mainstream media uh, outlet in the beginning and I evolved and I changed and then I talked about it. So that's part of uh, why people appreciate uh, what I do is because I went back to saying, okay, actually, you know what? I was misled. Now I understand it differently. Here's what the way I see it based on the information that's available to us. You know, this, this country needs to stay together. We do not need to support a group that says my ethnicity is better than the rest of you. So now we need to dominate this region. Um, and they're a minority ethnicity at that. Not that it would make it better if they were a majority, but they are a minority. So realistically speaking, they're up against a uh, hundred plus million people and there's only six or seven uh, million ethnic Tigrayans, but then way less political, uh, way less, uh, uh, TPLF members. So that's really who the region's up against, not ethnic Tigrayans, but this politically uh, ethno-fascist group. So I think that's my role in the community is to keep fighting back against ethnic divisions. You know, this idea that, uh, you know, values are assigned to certain ethnicity or race. Uh, we really just need to be able to have more you know, sober conversations about things that are happening on the ground, things that are happening here in the United States, and really come together based on shared values of, you know, truth, uh, you know, growth and respect for diversity, um, not assigning characteristics to people based on something that they cannot help, like their ethnicity or their race. And I think that's something that the whole world can do better with right i mean the united states is extremely divided from what i the way i see it it's divided based on ethnicity it's divided um uh sorry race here I, it's, it's more race here um divided based on race divided based on sexual orientation based on like all of these different issues that i think are weaponized to then make people just choose a side and stay there and it's very difficult to have conversations beyond that um, and the proof is in the pudding. I, I don't know if we've been more divided than we are right now. I mean, I, I don't have the data, but it, it feels like we're in a place where people can't even have conversations anymore unless they agree 100% with each other. Absolutely. I think you said it in the middle of your, in the beginning of your conversations, uh, saying that families are fighting over each other and then that's happening. So Harmila, when I, I, I knew I was going to interview, I kind of spoke to both sides because I wanted to hear the both sides of the story, right? So um, there is a general sentiment with few Ethiopian Americans that the current leadership in the country is not representing the traditional values of Ethiopia. I've had some Ethiopian Americans say that their relatives are tra trapped in Tigray where food, water, electricity, banking, and medical attention is kind of iffy. So obviously, there is there some truth to it, or um, some of the some of, some have relatives that they have helped flee because of the conflict too. So they feel it is religious, ethnic. I think you kind of spoke about it. So, oh, uh, what, what I mean, it's very hard for us sitting here to analyze what is the truth. But what would you say to those people that probably may not agree with you? 
So there's, I mean, there is definitely some truth to both sides. I think it's the context and who to blame that where the the strongest disagreements are. So like I said, my family's both from that uh, Northern region where the TPLF is in control right now. Uh, But we just have to sort of look at it. If it was another country, how would we look at it? If it was the United States and this group after uh, there was already a a government in place, they, they picked up arms and they, kill the National Army Defense Forces, uh, what would we do? And I think the answer would be you would condemn that group and you would be supporting uh, the the government of the people. Um, And that's, you know, and then what that group did in Tigray after starting the war is then weaponize the suffering of the people in that region who wouldn't have suffered if they didn't start the war and attack the army base in Tigray. So they take that suffering and they, you know, kind of, paraded around the world and say, see, look at all these people suffering, but you're the one who's making them suffering, suffer. Mm -hmm. You, the political group that started the war that did not respect the National Army Defense Forces who were slaughtered in their sleep and so in in many cases overnight or uh, released as prisoners and sent walking to the Eritrean border. um, You know, that is the the group that we should all be working together to eliminate on the in the international community, whether it's by diplomacy uh, at this point, um, because we've gone through the force route and they haven't been able to be fully eliminated, although many have been killed um, and some imprisoned. So it's, yes, there's suffering in Tigray. It's not because the Ethiopian government has blockaded aid. I mean, even the UN World Food Program has said aid has been flowing since at least April Uh, to feed 6 million people, which is about the total population in that region. So this idea that the Ethiopian government is blocking aid is untrue. Um, It's it's been corroborated by the World Food Program. Um, I mean, this region is essentially being held hostage by this ethno-fascist group. And so, yes, there's not electricity and communications. And why is that? Because they've killed utility workers that were there to fix it early on in the war when the federal government uh, was in charge up until June 2021 when they retreated, uh, uh, calling for a ceasefire. So anyone that talks about the plight of Tigray and the people in Tigray without then pointing their fingers at the TPLF is, is has an agenda. Uh, there's a lot of TPLF uh, members and kids of uh, members in the diaspora and in Ethiopia. And so they have an agenda. Uh, they, they, they want the group to be able to get uh, back into power. Um, and so even if they say that they care about the people in Tigray, as long as they're not pointing the fingers at the very group that endangered them by starting a war on their land, then it's a political game. Absolutely, Harmel. I think, thank you for explaining. I think I wanted to spend the first 30 minutes trying to kind of understand the extent of this issue and try to understand from both sides of the perspective. I appreciate your patience and kind of running me through everything. So you briefly mentioned about State Department. You just don't feel that there is a great ambassador from State Department. And uh, Harmel, as you know, uh, as much as I'm interested in geopolitics, it's extremely important to strengthen and and enhance a century old relationship between the United States and great country. Ethiopia, and also uh, build on a strong partnership based on common interest and mutual benefits for, of the two great countries. So what is the best way you think State Department can accomplish that? And um, are Ethiopian Americans living in Washington, D.C., or Americans in general, are they fighting for it? Yeah, so that question can best be answered by how the State Department has been handling it for so far in terms of the, the perception, at least, the PR element. So the special envoy for the horn, Mike Hammer, who uh, replaced, uh, he's the fourth uh, envoy who replaced the previous um, uh, envoy in June. He actually went to Ethiopia recently this week and he met with the Ethiopian government, the Ethiopian foreign minister. um, And then he went to Tigray where the TPLF is still um, in control and he took selfies with them. And it just, it didn't feel dignified. So with the Ethiopian government officials, they were sitting in meetings, official meetings, official uh, photos. And then they go to Tigray where this group now designated a terrorist organization by the Ethiopian government after the attack on the army base, they're taking pictures with them. So it just feels too, per- er, s- selfies with them. It feels too personal, it feels too friendly. It just goes back to these leftover personal relationships within this administration. Uh, that continue to elevate this ethno-fascist group that has had started this war that actually killed about 300 to 500,000 people from Tigray 
people from Tigray, that, that region has been so damaged by this group. So the diplomacy is extending too far. I mean, if you deem something a terrorist organization, which the United States itself uh, previously back in the day under Homeland Security has deemed them a terrorist organization. But then you go back and then you take these selfies and act friendly to this group that has caused so much pain to the region. So what I would have liked to see is maybe they needed to go to Tigray, uh, but why come off so friendly to these people that represent a group that has done so much damage to the region? And you know the support should go with the Ethiopian government, um, a democratically elected government, the uh, national security advisor to the PM of Ethiopia has come out with a statement saying what, what we just saw with the special envoy team going there was not what we wanted to see. What we wanted to see is them talking to this group and asking them for some concessions so we can move forward to peace talks. But they didn't come back with that. They basically came back uh, with the same offer that the TPLF uh, was demanding, which is everything. They want the Ethiopia, Ethiopian government to restore uh, uh, electricity and communication and banking without any, without really any guarantees about the safety of the people that it sends to do that um, and without any sort of agreement to move towards peace. So, I mean, four, four different special envoys, the turnover is, I think, speaks for itself. They're not sending their best. You know, they're not sending their best and the results are showing. Um, and so I don't know what's going to happen next, but um, you know, if, if, if the, if history, recent history is an indication, it's going to be another failed special envoy for the horn. Carmela, that, that is super sad to know, right? Because state department is there as a nice ambassador to kind of bridge the gap and that's not happening. And you're absolutely right. Optics matter. So what you do in your envoy does matter and they should have done it much more um, in a more diplomatic way or uh, more of a professional way. That's why they are supposed to be out there. So uh, before I go to Ethiopian Americans living in Northern Virginia or even living in America for that matter, uh, I do want to know our Biden policies, I feel like they're turning a blind eye to this conflict. Uh, do you agree with that? Uh, yes. Oh, see, this is where the conflicting parts come, comes in. On one hand, they are giving aid to the region. It is strategic um, and they are giving what a Appears to be a significant amount of aid um, to the region. Much of it is going to the Tigray region where the, the TPLF has held the people hostage. Uh, but nonetheless, they are still giving aid uh, to Ethiopia. They have cut off any military or security assistance um, in May of last year, which is unhelpful when you want to be um, in line with a government, democratically elected government that's fighting these, this, this armed group. Uh, and then on top of that, um, you know, Ethiopia has been delisted from AGOA, which is the African Growth um, uh, Act that 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 applies to the uh, manufacturing industry. Um, so they they delisted Ethiopia off of that, which means there was some financial um, agreements that were undone, which meant thousands of people in Ethiopia, mostly women that work in the manufacturing se sector, lost their jobs. So. The people are being punished through this war, and then they're being punished with some of the uh, Biden administration's policies. And there are two different um, bills also in, in the House and in the Senate uh, that are sanctions bills that are being pushed uh, through certain Congress people. They haven't passed yet, but those would also, uh, they, are, they are presenting potential sanctions against the Ethiopian government if they do not fix uh, what is going on within Tigray, or if they unilaterally do not somehow come up with uh, the peace uh, element. So that's, you know, the, the um, current administration says that, you know, they're not against the Ethiopian government, or at least when we try to talk to them, but when it comes to what they're saying on the world stage and what they're signing off on, it is punishing not just the government, but the people. Um, so that's been, and, and then you'll see some of the peripheral folks within the State Department um, you know, taking actions like what we saw last, uh, uh, what was it, last November or so, there were a group of federalists, granted no State Department person co-signed it, but they didn't condemn it either. There was a group of nine people, random people that claimed to be representing ethnic uh, uh, groups in Ethiopia, in the nation's capital, and they held a press conference saying, we are going to dismantle the Ethiopian government by diplomacy or by force. 
and Reuters was there, New York Times was there to legitimize uh, this, this, this presentation, excuse me, and the State Department didn't say anything about it. Nobody said anything about the fact that, hey, we're not, that's not something that we co-sign. Yes, it happened in the nation's capital. Yes, mainstream media was there, but we did not, that that's not an official policy for us on Ethiopia. That's an absolute conflict, absolute conflict. And that's where the confusion comes from, just like anything that Biden has been doing recent time. So Har Harmila, let me come to state level politics. I mean, as Ethiopian American community, I know it is led by an organization. I'm sure there are multiple organization at one of the organization that I'm very familiar with, where I met you, it is APAC, which is American Ethiopian Public Affairs Committee. Uh, under the leadership of Mr. Tegunu and also my good friend, Naomi Mesfin, I have to always give her a big shout out. Uh, she's a committed leader around here, made a huge difference in 2021 gubernatorial race uh, uh, by their coordinated efforts. Uh, you as an Ethiopian community chose not to vote based on party lines, but voted for the candidates that you felt resonated with your shared values and common interests, and also have the best interest of your communities here in your homeland at heart. So uh, my question is, if you're following politics, what kind of momentum do you think Ethiopian Americans will have uh, in the midterms? Are, you ha are they having the same motivation to say, hey, let us look at the policies, not exactly party, but let's look at the policies and vote for the candidate that best suits the policies? Absolutely. So broadly speaking, I think Ethiopian Americans have generally voted Democratic. Uh, but I think the way this administration has handled the war in Ethiopia has changed a lot of hearts, <laughs> uh, you know, realizing that maybe just maybe we're better off uh, voting differently. Some people have swung completely to the right. Others are just saying, OK, let's just really consider who the candidates are. Let's have conversations with them. Let's see if we align uh, in terms of our values and then let's vote based on that. Let's not just automatically vote democratic anymore because look what has what it has done in terms of the relationship uh, with Ethiopia. A lot of these, um, you know, the bills that I mentioned both in the House and the Senate, those 3199 and uh, HR 6600 in, in the House are uh, led by Democrats. Yes, there are some Republicans that have uh, sponsored them, but they're led by Democrats. Um, and so I think uh, American uh, APAC, American Ethiopian Public Affairs Committee is one group that's been created. Actually, they're pretty new. They, they've been created in the last couple of years when this, since this war started. GLEAN is another group uh, that's an Ethiopian American political um, action group that was created during this war. Um, you know, the, I think Ethiopian Americans are just finding their voice. Um, they generally speaking have kind of laid low in the American uh, political sphere, just kind of, you know, typical immigrant story. They come here, they this is obviously a generalization and not everyone fits in this category, but they come here, they get their education, you know, they're focused on their families, they work hard. Um, and that's been the, the way it's generally has been in 20 plus years. They haven't really engaged in a significant way with politics. I think the gubernatorial race in Virginia showed what can happen when they do do that. They came together and voted out uh, Governor Terry McAuliffe, a Democrat, uh, and voted in Youngkin because of how frustrated they were with the way that McAuliffe was talking about the war in Ethiopia and demonizing the government that was fighting this ethno-fascist group. So uh, I think it, it, the, the, the future is, uh, uh, has a lot uh, to offer, I think, in terms of what Ethiopian Americans can do and the part that they can uh, play in the American uh, dream and in the American sphere. Uh, I think for many, they realize being quiet and and not engaging is not an option because when a, a, a crisis time comes, then you don't have any friends. You don't have any relationships that you've built with the political uh, uh, representatives in your district on the state level, on the national level. Um, and so I think that is what I'm seeing in terms of the trend. There's also a lot going on here in California uh, where there's uh, groups that have come together and are trying to figure out, okay, Let's study who our candidates are. Let's reach out to them. Let's have conversations. Uh, there was an effort to do that with uh, Governor, uh, rather Congressman uh, Brad Sherman in California District 32, who is a huge TPLF supporter for whatever reason. I think it's because he gets a lot of his donations from them. Um, there was an effort to vote him out. It wasn't successful, um, unfortunately, but there was a lot to, to, to learn 
uh, and a lot that Ethiopian Americans learned through that process. So the best is yet to come in terms of the efforts of Ethiopian Americans, but I would argue the last couple of years have been an awakening for many politically. Harmel, I think you said it so eloquently that if our communities really rally up, we can change the dynamics, right? I can attest to the fact that APEC was instrumental in putting out mass messaging on social media, canvassing at Ethiopian Orthodox churches, restaurants in DC, texting thousands of people, hopes of rallying. So that's what tells. I mean, we don't always have to vote one way. We just really, and I think that's a good lesson even for the candidates. They have to hear us out. They have to come to our communities, get uh, embrace our communities, understand Understand our issue. And also, it's a good learning lesson for our communities to realize as minority communities, I tend to say this, when a crisis comes, you need to have a friend at state level, national level, and the only way you'll have is if you kind of engage with them. So uh, Hermila, again, coming, I can tell you about South Asian community. We are very focused on education. Uh, again, you spoke about some of the values, hardworking, bend your head, get focused on your education, meritocracy, all of those are very important to us. What, are the, what do you think are the top three issues or priorities for Ethiopian Americans? That's a good question. I'm just speaking, you know, from a personal standpoint here, I haven't necessarily done a proper uh, canvassing, but um, I think, you know, education is really big, health care is really big, and then policies towards the Horn of Africa would probably be, you know, three of the top things. Obviously, education and health care, very important to many of us here in the United States. Um, you know, here locally, when we were talking about uh, Congressman Brad Sherman, education was a big one for many people because we had a lot of parents with young kids uh, that were either in public schools or they weren't in public schools because the public schools in their area weren't good. Uh, we have a huge homelessness issue here in California, so that was an issue for some, which has also helped, you know, contributing to some of the crime, but the crime is also another element uh, that is important to people. It's gone way up here in, in Southern California, um, and so those three things were really important, and then, of course, there was the relationship uh, the Congress uh, people had or representatives had to uh, the Horn of Africa, and you know, those are the things that people should be vo voting on and they now want to vote on instead of just down party lines. Um, and I think that's what's going to make the community ultimately uh, powerful and impactful is because we will no longer be voting based on party lines, but actually trying to have a relationship with our representatives and really trying to uh, figure out how our values align um, and being civically engaged, I canvassed for the first time for a candidate. I actually don't know if I would be allowed to do that uh, with a mainstream media journalism job. That might have been part of the reason why I didn't do it. But I also never really had that sort of a strong interest to do that. So I canvassed for the first time for a political candidate. I'm a lot more uh, engaged civically than I was before because of what's happening. And I know that's true for a lot of people. And so that is sort of the profit out of this trial that many of us uh, will take moving forward. Absolutely, Hermila. I always say engaged uh, engagement is the best way to go. And also our kids learn, right? Once your parents are civic, uh, if we engage civic wise, then our kids are also imitating us. So uh, let's talk about African immigrants. They make up up to 14% of immigrants in the Washington metro area. And of, out of which actually Ethiopian immigrants are 4%. I work in Alexandria area and a lot of my co-workers uh, uh, in the hospital are Ethiopians. And it's just so nice to learn about the diversity, about different ethnic communities, and so on and so forth. So at, in Virginia, Harmil, I'm not sure if you know, elections happen every year. And when I'm kind of talking to them, I just don't think, uh, I mean, like a typical immigrant, I say nothing uh, different for uh, Ethiopian Americans, not very engaged at all. And I think we're all very good at voting in presidential elections, but never vote in local elections, right? And I, I mean, we know very well, all politics are local and local elections do matter. So what is the best way, first thing, um, if I'm the candidate running, what is the best way to reach out to Ethiopian American communities? Is it through church or is it just kind of going to the festivals? What is the best way to reach out? That's a good question. I think the organizations are a good start like APAC and GLEAN and then there's Ethiopian American Development Council in Colorado. I mean, there's, there's, there, there's uh, organizations all across the country. So just finding the one that's local or state level uh, that applies is a good place to start. Church is a good place to talk to a lot of people, but I know some churches 
have sort of rules about, you know, politics not mixing with the church. So it depends on the ch church. Um, we, I don't know if this would have been the best place for it, but you definitely would have accessed a lot of Ethiopian Americans in DC right around the time uh, where we had the, the dinner at APAC, there was also a, an annual soccer tournament that came back after a break during the pandemic. There were a lot of young people of voting age there. I mean, if there was a table there, um, if someone was a candidate I, and you're trying to run particularly in that area, in the DMV area, that would have been a great place to have a table every day of the tournament, which lasted about uh, a week. So uh, particularly in the DMV area, I mean, if Every time I'm there, it feels like little Ethiopia. <laughs> oh, absolutely. It is, it is. I think you, there is an, a place in DC where they call it as little, little Ethiopia. I think there's a place in California. Yes. They call it that, so it's kind of nice. Um, so Harmila, let me kind of turn that question just a bit around and say, do candidates and elected officials try to reach out to the community from your experience? Have you seen them mm. come around, try to understand what the issues are? Are, because I always say this is a mutual re relationship, right? As much as we want, uh, we preach our communities to get engaged, sometimes I have to take a step back and say, oh, candidates and elected. I know Democrats do, but what do you think about Republicans? I mean, I want you to be candid. Mm -hmm. we can, there's so much we can learn to, um, to kind of get to the communities. That's a good question. I mean, I know I saw some of uh, you guys in terms of the, the Republican representation at APAC, at the APAC dinner that we had recently in July. I don't know if there were Democratic representatives there. Um, in general, I would say I don't have enough data to even compare Democrats versus Republicans in terms of who reaches out and who doesn't. I would say broadly speaking, I know there's a candidate in the uh, DMV area, I forget her name, I believe she's of Indian descent, uh, but I think she does a really good job of, of reaching out to the community herself. But in general, I don't know that we've been counted as a significant voting block enough for people to come seek the community. Um, it's possible that it happens, but the general uh, perception or sentiment that I get from Ethiopian Americans is we need to step up and we need to let them know we're here because they're not seeing us. Um, and so I assume that applies to both parties um, all over the country because I don't I don't really have data saying otherwise. But that's you know just the general perception based on the conversations I've had with people. Absolutely. I think there is opportunity on both the sides, like in, in many immigrant communities, right? There is definitely opportunities on both the sides. Let's talk about voter registration, uh, Hermil. I'm sure that's not your expertise. Your expertise is geopolitics, but kind of uh, we are always, as the Fairfax GOP and 11th Congressional District, we are very focused on uh, doing voter registration because we know that there are conservative voters out there that believe in family for uh, faith and freedom and are very interested in having a White House administration that actually focuses on our native country and uh, does policies that favor our countries as well. So uh, how, uh, I mean, what are the chances that um, you know, parties can do voter registration in the communities? What is the best way to get to uh, get for the community to understand that voting is important uh, and uh, voter registration, once you're 18, you got to register and so on and so forth. Are those something that APEC handles or how does that work? APAC is definitely doing some of that work. So is uh, GLEAN, which is another national group. Um, on the state level in California, I know there's a lot of effort to get people to register to vote and they're trying to reach out to churches is uh, a good place, but also just whatever local Ethiopian community organization. I mean, in general, you can literally Google, you know, Ethiopian organizations in Maryland, Ethiopian organizations in Virginia, whatever pops up. I think reaching out to them is a really good way uh, to then engage them in terms of voter registration. Some may be, you know, 5013C, so they can't get too involved politically, but voter registration is one of those things that I think is an exception uh, to the rule for most. Um, and so that's, I mean, the churches are a big thing and there are, there are a lot of conservative values. I think for a while, those have been uh, overridden by maybe some of the values perceived among the Democrats. But I would say now is a really good time to engage people uh, and have conversations about what is it that they really stand for? What is their perception of the Democrats versus Republicans and really figure out what they actually think? Because right now, like I said, it's kind of a politically 
awakening moment for a lot of Ethiopian Americans, Eritrean Americans, Somali Americans, people of the horn. And so they're finding out that maybe the way that they've operated politically has not been the best path. Um, and they're more open to hearing from candidates of, from, or from political groups that they haven't historically voted for. Hermila, that's, that's a very, very good way of uh, kind of putting all together and saying that this is the best time. I think for either candidate, for either political party, but I think for Republicans, it's even bigger opportunity to come out and say, hey, you voted Democrat based on your perceived values, but these are our actual values. So I hope more candidates are listening to this. You eloquently put it out on how to engage Ethiopian Americans. Like um, Hermila, I say this to my immigrant friends all the time. If you're not at the table, we will end up on the menu. Mm -hmm. oh, we need to get into mainstream American political system. It is not OK to sit back because when the crisis situation comes, we don't have a friend at all whatsoever. So Hermila, we are in the last few minutes. I would love for you to take this opportunity and kind of summarize and talk to our voters and tell us um, what, what, what is out there that you're looking forward to during this midterms and beyond midterms. First of all, I love that quote. If you're not uh, at the table, you're on the menu. For sure, that is what has, that is what has happened in terms of foreign policy uh, to Ethiopian Americans as far as this conflict goes. Um, I think just in general, I would love to see voters as a whole be a little bit more critically thinking and not become pawns of either political group. Um, what I've noticed in general, you know, as someone who's worked in media for a long time, uh, is that the people are basically told what to think by whatever political party that they think that they support. Um, and there's not a lot of gray space in between. They don't really base it on individual candidates. You know, you're a Democrat, you're always siding with the Democratic rhetoric. You know, you're a Republican, you're always siding with the quote, quote, Republican rhetoric. And it's unhelpful in terms of coming up with decisions or making decisions that are good for the country. You know, let's not be so racially divided, let's not be um, so quick to to attack people for their ideas based on social issues. I mean, these should be things that we can have debates and discussions about. And let's not pledge allegiance to a party. I mean, it's it's kind of a sure way to have your vote be taken for granted. So if a party, and this is just, you know, all per, personal perspective, if a party thinks you're going to vote for them no matter what, then they don't owe you anything. They're not going to do anything for you. But if you say, yes, I'm registered like this, I believe I'm actually registered independent. But if you say I'm registered uh, A or B, but you know I'm still open to different kind of candidates and different kind of ideas, then people are actually going to compete for your vote. And so I think particularly for you know immigrant communities um, or minority communities in general, I from my perspective, we need to start being a little bit more critical of both parties equally, you know, Absolutely. not give a blanket check to one party and then always criticizing another party. So the party you're always criticizing realizes they're never going to get you. So they're not they don't need to fight for you. The party that you're always pledging allegiance to says they're all they're always going to get you regardless of what they do. Right. So you have literally neutralized your power when you take that approach. And I think that if anything, that's what I would leave with everyone as a voter is be a little bit more critical um, in your thinking and stop being told what to think, because uh, that's a lot of what I'm seeing and, and stop not listening. Like, don't let people tell you who to listen to. You know, I often listen to the long versions of people that I'm told to hate the long videos, because once you listen to them in long form, you realize, okay, this is not what everybody told me to think of this person or that person. Um, and so it's a lot of hard work. Some of it you need to rely on organizations like, you know, American Ethiopian uh, Public Affairs Committee and whatever other organization that you think represents your block. Uh, but some of it is just going to have to be personal responsibility and just taking the time to listen to different ideas. Carmilla, I know you're very good at social media. The last statement that you put out about how to not let anybody, let everybody compete, I think you should put it out in every platform possible. That should, re that should resonate to every immigrant community that's always been voting one side or the other. I mean, I know I leaned right, but that doesn't mean that I would say as a uh, constituent, um, 
And without understanding policies, don't just blindly vote. I'm one of those person that would say critically, I think you said it so eloquently, critically think it through and don't pledge your allegiance all the time to one because look what Democrats have done to, in fact, African-Americans, I say that to my African-Americans. Before I let, I let you go, Hermila, you, ta you talked about another organization called GLEAM. What is that? Uh, can you elaborate a bit on that? Gleam is another organization that was created by um, Ethiopian Americans since this war started. I can actually give you both uh, website. It, it stands for uh, uh, Global Eth the, let me let me look it up. Um, Global Ethiopian Advocacy Nexus. Okay. Uh, so that's another organization that I believe is national that started a little bit before APAC, but is trying to do similar work. Um, they both tend to work together and they've got some overlapping, but that's another uh, organization that can be engaged in terms of the politics that Ethiopian American Development Council is Colorado based, but they're national also. There's a lot of 5013Cs um, uh, that are publicly engaged in terms of the, 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 the politics. So those are, I think, good places to start when trying to engage um, Ethiopian Americans in particular. Thank you. Harmila, this has been a pleasure. I'm just looking at the time. I can't believe 55 minutes. You are not only eloquent, you have such good understanding about geopolitics. Um, although I have so many Ethiopian American friends, it took me a while to kind of get a hang of the geopolitical and horn of America, Africa. So I thank you for taking the time. I know you're a very busy lady. I thank you for taking the time. Your community respects you. I've seen that uh, right with my own eyes. Your community respects you, adores you. Yes, there are some community members that disagree with you, but that's disagreement is healthy. I mean, it's important that you have that kind of resistance. So you're always sitting back and critically thinking about it. That's why my questions were more like on both the sides because I wanted to kind of get an understanding of both. But again, Hermila, thank you so much for coming on. I hope you will continue to be uh, engaged with Fairfax GOP and Northern Virginia politics. Um, I hope to see you in the future. I think for our viewers, I would say, let's not continue to let any administration blind side us on foreign policy. I would say this to immigrants, let us not vote for the candidates that neglect our communities and our values. Uh, never do that. Your vote is very precious. Midterms are coming up. Please stay engaged. I'll continue to bring exceptional folks like Hermila. Um, I'm thankful for her engagement. And if you would like to see any speakers come through, please don't hesitate to put it in the chat. Hermila, uh, at the end, there has been a lot of uh, discussion on Facebook. I think you would like, uh, you would probably enjoy listening to the comments. So uh, most of them are very productive comments. It's just really nice to know where people stand. I thank you for coming on to the show. I thank all of you for listening to Conversations That Count. I pray to God that the civil unrest in Ethiopia will settle down soon and Ethiopia will bounce back as one of the fastest growing economics that it, it truly was a couple of years back. Uh, God bless Ethiopia, Ethiopian Americans, and God bless America. Thank you. And how Amen. Amen. Sulaka, yeah, thank you so much for providing this platform. I don't know that we see enough immigrant Americans really discussing, you know, civic engagement and politics and geopolitics, both, you know, the, the domestic and international. So I think this is an amazing platform. Thanks for your balanced view. Thanks for asking the questions from both ends and, and getting us all, including myself, to think a little bit more about uh, what we want moving forward. So I appreciate your time. Thank you so much, Hermila. Good luck Thank with you. it. Thank you.